Um, so yes, what I'm going to talk about today is this um, this project up here called Fuse, um, which is a project I wrote a couple of months ago, and right now we are at a point where it's beginning to catch up to production use uh, at a customer. Um, so I'm going to present the project and the background about behind the project and how it's built and so on and so forth. Um, let me see if I can get this guy to actually understand me. This is better. So the problem is that once you have a large, complicated Erlang system, there are certain things you cannot avoid. Uh, the first thing is that you cannot avoid to have many, many applications in that uh, in the Erlang nodes you're running. And you will usually also have a lot of cascading subsystems. So you will have MySQL databases, caches, foreign APIs running on different servers out in the world. And the problem is you don't control a lot of these uh, foreign things. And then the problem is when one of those ca cascading subsystems, they have errors, um, the fingers get pointed at your system because you are dependent on that cascading subsystem. Um, and then all of a sudden you have errors and fingers get pointed at you and they are saying, well, your, your, your earning system is working like something really bad because really uh, it's wrong. But what is really the error is that there's a cascading subsystem in there that has the bug. Um, the idea of uh, one, you cannot really solve this, but you can try to mitigate it. So. Um, this is what Fuse is about. It's about mitigating errors in cascading subsystems. Um, Fuse implements a pattern which is called the circuit breaker pattern. And that one, the first time I read about it was uh, by, what is his name, Mike, Michael Nygaard in his book, Release It. Um, <clears throat> so a good analogy of what is happening is that you have a Fuse box in your home so if you overload your electricity, the fuse will, will blow. Uh, and the circuit breaker essentially works in the same way that we have a system, uh, and as long as it works like it should, uh, the circuit breaker is closed. Um, and then when you begin tracking errors in the uh, cascading subsystems of what you have, you tell the fuse that it melts a bit. Essentially, you say that you begin to see problems in the system. And once the, um, the fuse is melted too much, that is, once you break its policy um, for how many errors it'll tolerate, it breaks. Meaning that rather than going to the cascading subsystem, you just return immediately and say, well, the fuse is broken, you, uh, you don't want to go to the target system. So that's the idea. Then, then we run with the circuit breaker open for a while, so we're not hitting the cascading subsystem because we know it's broken, we know it won't work anyway. And then after a while, after a cool down period, we uh, essentially have the, the fuse, fuse cooling down, and that means we close the circuit breaker again, so we get connectivity back to the system. So it's a way to essentially mitigate an error in a cascading subsystem by not touching it for a while. Right. Um, Fuse is open source and built mainly by me, and Thomas Art has come with a lot of helpful hints while I built it. Uh, it's built also with thanks to Erlang Solutions and Issue because they have kind of allowed me to do it uh, and use some of their time for it. Um, so what are the characteristics of a circuit breaker? Why do you even do it? Well, the, the first thing is that you have no resource built up in your Erlang system. So say you have a database and you're trying, uh, you're timing out in the database. While you have processes in your Erlang system timing out, there'll be resource building up. There'll, there'll be resources that you're wasting essentially in your Erlang system while this is happening, right? You don't want that. So by rather than trying to, to wait for the timeout, just return back and say, this ain't going to work anyway. Um, well, then we don't have that resource, resource build up. The second thing is that we don't have to wait for the timeout to happen. We respond in roughly four microseconds. So we have a much better latency, even though we're still going to report an error, but now we report an error in four microseconds rather than in, say, 5,000 um, milliseconds. So that's way better. The, the next thing is that a client can discriminate between a, a long timeout 
and an error because we can return a different error message if the fuse is broken. Um, and this actually makes clients able to, to give better user experience. Um, for instance, if you have a web page where you have some counts displayed, those counts might not be important for the whole experience of the page. It's an added value, but it's not important for the rest of what you are seeing. So if you make a call into a server and the server says, well, the fuse is broken, I cannot give you the counts, we can just ignore that and not render that part of the web page. And that means we can still, we can still render a page to the user even though there are certain subsystems down, right? Um, that might help uh, going forward. And then finally, if you have a... Um, if you have a, a fuse, uh, that is an excellent place to do monitoring on your system, right? If you know whether or not the fuse is broken, you know whether or not a cascading soft system is probably down. So that's another reason for why having a fuse. Um, <clears throat> then I'm trying to do some things in order to make this easy to use. Uh, so it has uh, eDoc all over the place with proper documentation, and it is only the exposed APIs that are documented. There's a tutorial in there. It's built on Travis CI, so you know that it builds. Uh, it uses semantic versioning. There are Git tags in there, so you can latch onto a Git tag uh, if you want that. Um, and then the goal is to try to implement the circuit breaker pattern in an Erlang idiomatic way and not in... So, so you can find examples of this implemented in, say, Ruby or in Python, but just porting those into the Erlang world wouldn't be Erlang idiomatic. So I'm trying to utilize other OTP things inside to have while I'm writing the circuit breaker. So that's the idea. Um, so a quick way of using it. Um, let's see, yeah. So a quick way of using it is that first you have to configure a fuse. Um, so max i there is the intensity of the fuse. It tells us that we allow 10 errors the max t is the time frame, the window in which we allow the errors. So this says we want well, our policy is at most 10 errors in 60 seconds. And that's the sliding window. Uh, the name is just any name, usually an atom, given to the fuse. So we can have multiple fuses in the system and discriminate them. The strategy is, there's only one strategy, which is the standard strategy at the moment. So you give it the intensity and the time. The refresh is when the fuse breaks, how long time, what is the grace time before it heals? So in this case, it's, it's uh, 60 seconds. It's given in milliseconds. So then you take the strategy and the refresh and makes that, make that into the options, and then you fuse install it. So this is a dynamic ins installation of the fuse. Uh, so you would usually do this in your application startup uh, once the fuse application is running. So once you have configured the fuse, you can use them. So here's the typical usage. You ask the fuse for its state, um, and you have, a, a, you have a choice of context. You can do it synchronously, or you can do it uh, asynchronously and dirty, which means that you have eventual consistency for the result. Uh, that's way faster than asking synchronously, so there's a performance consideration to make. Um, but as we'll see, there's, there's a reason for why I have the sync in there. Um, and th what you get back is either OK or blown. So if it's OK, you can go do your work on your database. If it's blown, you have to return some error thing because the fuse is obviously wrong and, and it's, it's broken. Um, when a timeout occurs, you essentially tell the fuse to melt itself, like the second exa example. So in this case, it's eMySQL that has some kind of timeout, and then we have a connection lock timeout in which case we melt the fuse a little bit. Uh, quite simple. And once it has been melted enough, the policy will say, OK, now it's blown. And then the ask will re begin returning blown. Right? It's, um, that's the way it works. So <coughs> what are the performance char characteristics of the system? Well, we have this laptop here, which is a pretty new MacBook. And that runs 2.1 million fuse asks per second. Um, so that, that is with eight cores. So all eight cores is operating uh, and max, maxed out while doing this. Each call takes around three, four microseconds. 
Um, and I have a Lenovo, which is the Core i7 before this one. So that's an Ivory Bridge. This is a Haswell. And that does roughly the same. So it might be memory bound, I don't know. Um, so that's the that's the current the current speed of the system. Uh, of course, that's just a simple stress test. I didn't really uh, do thorough benchmarking on this. I just needed a rough number, uh, and it's an upper bound in the sense that if I'm doing other things on the machine, of course, I cannot re achieve this because I'm maxing all cores while doing this. Um, I think it's somewhat disappointing using 3,000, 4,000 nanoseconds per lookup on an ETS table is. I don't understand why it's so slow. I would have expected it to be like 10 times faster. Um, so there's definitely something I don't understand and I need to dig into the code and run perf on it to understand what is actually happening in the own system because um, I think, I mean, a normal, I know that there are two mutexes I have to take and there are two DRAM axes uh, and that gives around 250 nanos. So I'm off by an order of magnitude, roughly, for this. And I don't understand why. So I want to understand it. But anyway, I, I do 2.1 million. So that's a ballpark figure. Um, then Fuse has uh, two things which makes it more erlang than most other things. First of all, it has a monitor that monitors states and monitors state changes. Um, and that monitor injects into the alarm handler alarms when fuses are blown or cleared. So the way it works is as soon as we see a blown fuse, we raise an alarm for that fuse that says, this fuse is now broken. Now you can plug anything into your alarm handler and then export it to NACIOS or whatever you have to, to do, uh, to do uh, monitoring on this. And then it has a hysteresis algorithm. So as soon as it's seen an OK for a while on the fuse, so it has mended and, and it has been mended for a while, it clears the alarm. But it avoids flapping. So if it goes down and goes up immediately after, it will not return a clear in the race again. It'll keep it raised until it has seen OK for a while, and then it'll clear it. So it, it, it tries to avoid flapping. Um, and then there's also a gen event in there, so you can subscribe to change events in, uh, in fuses. And that's actually pretty useful. Um, say you have a system that you are querying, and then you have a queue in front of things that wait uh, until they are ready to run for on this system because there's a limit in there and you figure out that the fuse is blown. Then you can empty your queue because that won't work, right? They'll just come here and they'll just hit the fuse and be blown. So what you do is you listen and just subscribe to the event and once the event happens, you just clear the whole queue. You can do that because you have eventing in the system. So you ju just build a handler that subscribes to that event and, and you, are, you are good to go. The implementation, so, so Torben actually did, just before this talk, he did a talk on notation he calls Visual Erlang. Um, and I've been a little bit involved in that. So this is the Visual Erlang diagram of the architecture. Uh, I'll come back to it, but the next slide has kind of like the textual thing, and then I'll, I'll come back to the slide and try to describe what it means. Um, so, the way it's built is that there are two paths in this system. There's a fast path and a slow path. So the fast path is the typical ask that hits an OK, because that's the thing that'll happen most often in this system. So we want that to be bloody fast. If we have a melt, that's allowed to be slow. So we don't care. Um, the way we implement it is that we have an ETS table, and the fast path just asks the ETS table directly. It doesn't even go through a gen server because that gives us parallel access. We define read concurrency true on the ETS table to get very fast access. So this is the primary reason we get the 2.1 million reads per, per second. Um, if you melt, there's a fuse server in there and you send the message to the fuse server and the fuse server keeps track of the policies and might flip the ETS table state from an OK to a blown and vice versa if it heals. The server is a single point, uh, essentially. And, and then the way it works internally in the fuse server is that it maintains a list of timestamps. Uh, the most recent timestamp is at the head of the list. And whenever we want to check a state, we just walk through the list and we prune away everything that's outside the window. And that's very easy because they're ordered. 
Um, so at cer a certain point, we reach something that's outside the window, and that means the tail is outside the window. So we just cut off the tail, and what we have left is what, we, uh, what we're interested in. So taking the length of that list tells us the current intensity, and that'll explain whether or not we are above intensity or whether or not we should blow the fuse. Uh, this is the same way that uh, the supervisor currently works. So you have marks R and marks T in supervisors, and they work the same way. Uh, it can be optimized quite a lot, and I haven't gotten around to do that yet. So there's no, some optimization possibilities there, uh, but it's on the slow path. So I don't know whether or not it's important yet to optimize. So if we go back to the diagram, um, do I have a mouse? I do have a mouse. So the way it works is that the client hears the process, uh, the fuse server hears the process, and the fuse monitor hears the process. Um, the fuse monitor only looks at this, which is the ETS table, containing the name of fuse and the state of the fuse. Uh, and the fuse monitor is out here and not connected to the rest of the system because if he crashes, it doesn't affect the fuse. Right? So that's a nice isolation property. Um, there are two ways you can ask the fuse. So you can ask asynchronously, which means that this ask async operation is living inside this module, the fuse server module. Um, but it, the, it, the client asks directly, um, and then it gets the state from here and returns it here. If it asks synchronously, which is the other thing, then we actually go in here, but then we are actually asking through the fuse server process. And that's not going to give us 2.1 million queries a second. That is going to be way, way, way slower. Um, and there's a reason for why I have both the sync and the async, and we'll see that in a while. Um, so that's the architecture and how it works. Um, correctness, right? What is the uh, problem here? The problem is that Fuse is a mission critical system in the sense that you place it in front of cascading subsystems and if it's wrong, then you are introducing more bugs than you originally had. That's a bad situation. We don't want that. So, the reason for that is to say, well, it's a prime, prime candidate for extensive testing because it's, it's sitting for every cascading subsystem call. So let us use QuickCheck on it. Um, so QuickCheck is used for uh, testing all of fuse, essentially. Um, and the model is that I build a property-based test first. So essentially, all properties are written before the code is written. Um, which is, which is a fun rule to play by uh, when you are writing code. So you're not allowed to write implementation code before you have a property that describes what you're trying to implement. And the way you do it is you say, well, I have an empty property, and now I define a, a, a fuse install command and define what that should look like. And then you have a property that only tries to run, run install commands on your system, right? And that, of course, fails because you don't have the code for it, so you're going to implement the code. And when that works, you say, oh, I need a, an ask command. Let me add that. Yeah. So you do it property-based first. So it's like test-driven test design, only that we are trying to extract properties rather than mere test cases. Um, so what are we trying to achieve? Well. The thing we're trying to do is we're trying to do what is called positive and negative testing both. So the difference between those two is that positive testing tests the things we, the, the normal use of the tool, right? So we're, we're just doing, we're playing along and we're playing the game. We are playing inside the specification we defined. Negative testing, on the other hand, tries to inject faults into the system. So we might try to do something to a fuse that doesn't exist or we might try to inject a configuration that is not valid, uh, something like that. And then we expect the system to actually answer with an error, right? If, if we do something that's wrong and the system says, yeah, well, I took it, I'm fine, happily, then, then something is obviously wrong with our system. So we do negative testing as well. The other thing we do is we do parallel testing because QuickCheck can do parallel testing on stateful models. So that means we really do have multiple clients spawned at the same time that tries to access the fuse at the same time in order to try to weed out eventual race conditions in there. Because we don't want race conditions in this code either. 
And then we use Pulse finally, which means that Pulse is a tool in QuickCheck that takes the Erlang scheduler and controls it. So you decide, the Pulse system decides in which order uh, different processes run inside your system. So that means I can, I can get a random schedule, um, meaning that if there is a race condition in there, I'm more likely to hit it, hit it, because once in a while I'll try a schedule which is very unlikely in practice. Right. Furthermore, it has the advantage that I can replay a schedule, which is very important, because once I find an error, I need to try to simplify the code, shrink, as QuickCheck is calling it. I have to simplify my counterexample while still keeping the same schedule, so I don't kind of like uh, lose grasp of the error. And that usually happens with parallel testing, where you, you, you have an error in the code, but it's parallel, and that means it's very... Um, it's elusive, and, and once you try to simplify the code, you change the schedule order, and then all of a sudden the bug goes away. Right? So Pulse allows me to nail a specific process schedule in there, and that means that I can, I can reproduce errors uh, given a given schedule. So it's a very useful tool. Um, so that's also being used in this project. Um, then in order to make sure that we hit things, we do requirements testing. So if you identify all the requirements of use, there are 16 requirements in all that looks like this. So for instance, uh, group, the install group has requirement, requirement number three here that says that we try to install a fuse with some kind of invalid configuration. And this requirement says that we also have to try to install a fuse with a valid configuration. Right? So we have a number of requirements. If we try to melt something, it has to be installed. We also have to try to melt something that's not installed. So that's the negative variant of the first one. And the same for ask. And there's 16 in all of those. Um, the thing is that uh, the quick check model contains these requirements and tracks whether or not we're hitting them giving a specific test. So that means we can get outputs like these. So if you run uh, the sequential test for five seconds. You get about 1,200 tests. Uh, these up here are the different commands we have tried to fire. So we aggregate and tell whether or not we have hit uh, different commands in the system. Uh, down here we have a requirements list that essentially says what requirements we hit for those tests. So that gives us a view of whether or not we hit all the requirements we set up in our test specification or not. So it tells us whether or not we are covering all things. Right? Um, I think I have an example somewhere. If I uh, let me go in and get the code. Uh, so sequential test five seconds. See, yeah. Ah, so there's something wrong here, and the thing that's probably wrong is that there's some code that doesn't work. Let's see. Oh. Ah, I know why. Um, I just have to clean the code and then say there are two ways to compile the code. One that makes it possible to compile it with uh, one that makes it possible to run under the quick check model and one that doesn't. Um, so you have to use the right one, otherwise it'll fail. So let's run again. So here it runs. That's better. So in five seconds, so it got a little less test this time around. So up here you have the command aggregation of all the commands that was run, and down here you have all the, uh, all the uh, different uh, requirements. Of how, how for my, so this one here says that in 4% of all the times, in 4% of all tests, this particular requirement was hit. Right? So when you run this for eight hours and a night, uh, you can make sure that you have a couple of million tests, and then you have uh, the same here, but you make sure that some of the requirements down here that are very unlikely gets more and more likely, right? So, so you get a good distribution of all your requirements. That's the goal. So you do that. 
Um, so that's done as well. Um, the way the quick check implementation is done is that we use quick check to build a model, right? So, uh, for instance, infuse time is a very important property uh, because time is what tells us whether or not we're inside the window. So what we do is we mock time. We build a model that essentially controls time and then we use that instead of OS timestamp when we are checking, such that we can, we can control when time elapses in the system. But then we need to be sure that our timing model is correct. So how do we do that? Well, we use quick check to check the model of time. Right? And once we have that model, we can use that in our real quick check model. So it's essentially like math. We build up lemmas. We build up small pieces of code in quick check, um, and we, we build up small pieces of code that we intend to use in quick check models, and then we use quick check models on those small pieces to make sure that they are correct, such that we can go to the next thing and use those small pieces in our real models. So that's a, that's a nice way of doing it, because that means you, you're essentially building up stepping stones uh, of, of lemmas or theorems on which you are, you are standing the next time. Um, of course, everything here is approximative, so you don't have the guarantee that things will be correct uh, because of the randomization property. But I still, I, I'm still willing to bet that it is way better than most other tools are doing it. Um, then there is the monitor code. It has a separate quick check model because it's a separate tool, essentially. So this is one of the places where if you do property-based testing first, you will have your code guided by the property-based testing. In this case, um, what happens is that you figure out that all the monitor code can happen in isolation from the rest of the code. So that also means that you can build a separate quick check model to handle the monitor code. Um, so the monitor essentially reads from the ETS table into the fuse monitor and then it invokes the alarm handler. That's the, the way the monitor works. So what we do is, QuickCheck has this EQC component feature that allows us to mock certain pieces of the code base. So we mock the alarm handler and tell the model what arrays and clear commands to the alarm handler we expect the monitor to make in a given state. And then our state transitions are basically setting up the ETS table in a certain state and then calling the monitor and see what happens. So now we are isolating the monitor from the rest of the system by mocking things underneath it and controlling things above it. Um, so that allows us to check the uh, quick check, the, uh, the alarm handle. Um, so one of the problems you will find when you do this is that um, if you try to run Fuse with Pulse and use this async dirty access context, then it finds a problem in the code base. Essentially, the code is not linearizable. And you get out this diagram down here, which I'm not really going to dig too much into, and you stare at it for like 20 minutes, and then you figure out where your, your race condition is. Um, so, so Pulse allows, when, when Pulse builds a counterexample, it can draw these diagrams that tells what order in which your scheduler has uh, executed different things. So you can see what order in which your program has run. And that then allows you to derive what your race condition is. Um, so when you look at this diagram for a while, the blue thing out here is, is a process that, that implements time, so it mocks time. So what you do is you go down and you, you look at when, when different processes ask for what time it is. And what happens inside the system is that you have a, you end up in a situation where you have an inconsistent read. So you have, you have a situation where uh, one of the processes get blocked for a long time. So this is very unlikely to happen in a real system because the Erlang scheduler will usually just make the, the, the guy run. But when running under Pulse, there's a real possibility that this process will be blocked for way too long. So what happens is that the, the, the Pulse decides that the very unlikely scenario is going to happen right now. So he blocks this guy for a very long time. And then all of a sudden, you have one other process that tries to read whether or not a fuse is OK or blown, and he gets the wrong answer. Because he gets an OK while 
the rest of the atomicity guarantees in the model says that it should be blown. Um, so in practice, I don't think it matters. I th what, what, what will happen in practice is that you will have a few processes that gets an okay while they should have gotten a blown. Um, and that's okay because once it's blown, everyone else will see it as blown for a while. So, so it's, it's just a question of how many do you allow in the corner case. And it depends on how fast and how much this few server process that handles the meldings gets, gets blocked. Um, so if you're not concerned about that, you can use async dirty and get your 2.1 million asks per, per second. If you're worried about that, you can use sync and then Paul says it's okay. But then your query, query speed will probably not be 2.1 million a second. Um, especially because you are essentially linearizing everything on one process. So you cannot get all eight cores to work, right? One process has to work inside this few server process and that will be way slower. So you lose parallelism as well. On the other hand, then, then it's linearizable, which you could argue is the right thing. And that also tells you why you have both the aging 30 and the sync variant. Because I think that in practice, most people, is, most people would be happy with the aging 30 variant and the higher parallelism compared to the other thing. So that's, that's a trade-off. I give you the option to pick. Um, there's a timing problem in there. So I made a mistake when I wrote the client. Um, the brilliant idea I thought I got was that I said, well, time is an injected parameter. So I have a number of clients. They want to do melt a few. So what they do is the client takes a timestamp, and then he, copy, he sends a message with the timestamp inside the, uh, the server process. Because that's nice. Now I get parallelism on taking timestamps. The problem is that <laughs> the problem is that it doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work because, say, in the if we if we try to take the worst case, uh, the worst case is that I have two clients and distributed nodes, and they both take the timestamp and then they try to inject it. But one of them is on a node that has a very high latency toward the um, the target system, and the other doesn't. So they might arrive in the wrong order, right? Or I might take the timestamp and get blocked right after I've taken the timestamp, but before I sent the message. Because that's where my reduction count ran out. In that case, I get behind in the schedule and another one gets to run, gets to take the timestamp and inject that. So now time gets injected in the wrong order in the server, meaning that time runs backwards. And that is a problem because I have an assumption of time is monotonically increasing in the system. So then you have a choice again to make. I could change the code such that it can handle that time is not monotonically increasing, which leads to a lot of code bloat because you have to handle the special case. So you have to sort time now and there's all other, other kinds of things that can go wrong. Or you could just disallow it. So I opted for the simple solution that disallowed it. Uh, what happens now is that if a message comes into the server, the first thing the server does is to take the timestamp. Um, and that, of course, it linearizes time because now it's monotonically increasing. Um, interestingly enough, it's that timestamp which makes this problem go uh, be a problem with Pulse because then what happens is you get the timestamp and then you get blocked. And then time elapses. Um, and that's actually where you get the incon inconsistent read. Um, so what we did is, we, we, uh, once we figured that this is probably a bad idea, we wrote a quick check model for it, Thomas did. And that quick check model very quickly figures out that this is a very bad idea. And it produces a nice counter example that says why you shouldn't be doing this. So we opted not to do it and then we, well, yeah, skipped that idea. So, that, is, that was a major timing problem we had in the code, and it took some while to find it. I mean, we, we, I was going down the wrong path when I tried this, um, because I, I wasn't fast enough to say, well, it might be my implementation code that is completely and utterly wrong. So I was, I was trying to fix the code while it's probably much more, it's, it's the architecture of the code that's wrong in this case. Right? Um, 
and the thing that kind of like the kind the thing that that hinted it was this quick check model essentially because once we began writing that we could see that well this will never ever work in any way or form uh, so what are the results of using quick check here uh, first of all it slows you down uh, in my case it tends to slow me down by a factor of three to five um, so time to market is slower because, well, you have to write the property before you write the implementation, which means that you have to come up with the property before you write the implementation, and that can be hard. It also means that you don't write that much code, you're thinking more about what is the right property to use. Um, it is slowly getting into production. We haven't had any issue in production yet in any places. I know there are few people that are using it, uh, there are no issues filed on GitHub yet. Uh, I have not used any time for maintenance on, th on this code yet. And I think that's the story. So the initial release might be slower, but I'm, I'm willing to bet that you will get way less errors on the code base afterwards because you have so much higher a bar set with the property-based test. Um, so that's, that's definitely a win. Uh, another interesting win is that quick check essentially suggests code paths that you shouldn't have. Um, and that makes the code way, way leaner. Um, the trick is that you can do, what you can do is you can say, rather than handling this code path, I just make that thing illegal to do. Return bad arc and then delete the code for that code path. Um, a really good example was that when I have this configuration thing here, um, here, uh, initially max i, so, so what is the range of this value? Here it's 10, but what is the valid range? That's a valid question. So initially it was zero and more, so positive or zero. So what happens if you give an intensity of zero? Well, that means you can tolerate zero melts in some window. That kind of doesn't make sense, does it? But I allowed that, uh, which means that the fuse start in the blown state and never ever can go out of the blown state. But if you look at the code, then you get a duplicate code path that handles that case completely isolated to the other code path that is the positive path. So this corner case essentially doubles the code size. So once you figure that out, you say to the quick check model, well, don't generate that zero case. Make it part of the illegal thing, right? And then return an error if you try to give a configuration where max i is zero. That then halves your code size you have to implement. So that's only half the size of code that I can expect there to be box, right? So that's, that's the idea there. Remove that problem entirely by just ripping out code. Um, so I did that instead. Um, and I think that, that is essentially where you get, um, I think that's essentially where you begin getting the big win from quick check and doing it so much upfront as I did in this project. Because that's, that's where you begin really, the thing is it gets way harder to implement code if you have to write the property first, right? Because you have to come up with the property and that makes you honest in the sense that you're not going to write some code unless you really need it. So what happens is that you become much more resistant to just adding another code path because, well, hey, that's... Because you know that once the, the quick check model will kind of hammer you on your head and say that this doesn't work unless it's, it's real. So I, I really think that overall uh, quick check was a win uh, in this project. Um, so yeah, let me see where. I have a lot of time. <laughs> I have no more slides. Um, so, do people have questions? There's one there, let me. Uh, so actually I have two questions. Yes. Um, the first one is, it seems like performance was really important, but um, it was unclear to me whether there's one fuse server for the entire node or there's per one, fuse. There's one per node at the moment. Okay, is there any reason it wasn't per fuse, that way fuses don't interact with each other? Um, currently because, so 
the reason I, I, I really thought about that, uh, my, my expectation is that males are rare and on the slow path. Since they are on the slow path, I currently didn't want to optimize for this um, before I really needed to do it. My expectation is if you do that change, the model can be used on order it. So my guess is it'll just work if I were to make that change. But I also want to see that the melting is the problem before doing it. Because you're right, having a single fuse server is a contention point in this case. Um, one thing that might be uh, better to do, uh, one thing we might win by splitting it, is that if you do synchronous asking where you go through the fuse server, then having multiple of those would give be better parallelism, right? Unless everybody contends on the same fuse. But that's not likely. So that's definitely a, an option. Definitely. Um, and from my understanding, like on a regular server with something like NTP, time can move backwards? Is that um, a pro does the VM take care of that? Or will your fuse just be in a weird state for a little while? That depends on what you're using. So if I think currently that it, it actually does it the wrong way. Um, one, one of the weaknesses of using quick check like this, where you control the time, is that I build a model of time, right? And the model of time um, is monotonically increasing. But NTP, by default, isn't, right? It can skew. So unless you have some kind of thing in the kernel that handles time skew, which some operating systems have, then you're in trouble. The, the, the fix is quite simple. The fix is to substitute OS timestamp for Erlang now, because Erlang now actually does have this protection. On the other hand, that might, uh, that might hit melting a little bit. But I don't care in this case because melting is on the slow path. So that's, that's a really good suggestion for a fix. Uh, and that would essentially eliminate that problem. There was a question down there as well. Uh, are any of the test things runnable with proper or without quick check? Um, currently, no. Uh, the reason is that some of the features that are used in uh, this project is not part of proper. Uh, specifically, proper does not have a, an equivalent to pulse, so you cannot control the schedule, and proper does not have an equivalent to uh, the component parts of the monitor, the monitor check. The, the mocking is not part of proper either. So those two, those two makes it hard. Um, the other thing is that um, quick check nowadays have a different ways of defining stateful machines. So they have something called group commands, and I've used group commands in this project, and proper doesn't have that. So that's another problem you have. So you can translate a lot of this into proper and run it in proper, but there's a translation effort. I mean, it's, it's isomorphic, so it's just mechanical work, but you still have to do it. Um, I think currently, so, so yesterday John Hughes had this uh, Cubic CI tool. They essentially made, made a quick check uh, continuous integration environment in the uh, spirit of Travis CI, where you essentially can run quick check tests on their machines. So that would be a really good thing to enable in this project, right? Because then once you have a pull request, it'll automatically get run on quick check. And that, that would be the way to get this going with, uh, with uh, this open source project if you do not have the model. I mean, or if you do not have quick check. Yeah, we, we haven't got quick check. Yeah, yeah. yeah. because yeah, I, mean, I mean, the model is, the model is written here. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's there. It's just a question of uh, running your change under the model, right? Yes. So you can still use it without quick check? Sure. There's a common test case in there that runs a very rudimentary test on it that checks for basic correctness. And that's run as part of the Travis CI build. Yes. More questions? If there isn't, thank you.